Hey everyone, welcome back to Everything is Relative. I'm Mr. K, and today we're going to be doing a crash course on the topic of electric fields for CAIE A-level physics. Now, the topic of electric fields will assume that we know certain things like that of charge. And as a reminder, we all know that if I have two like charged objects, two objects with similar charge, that is positive and positive, or negative and negative, then they will repel each other. And so in this case, I've done the example of two positive charges. And these two positive charges, when brought close enough to each other, will repel and push each other apart. And if you did IGCSE physics, you would have done numerous examples or demonstrations about how positively charged uh, objects will repel each other. So what is charge? Charge is simply a property. If any object has this property, it'll interact with any other object with this property. And so again, this is just a crash course, hence we're going to move relatively fast uh, in this crash course with the topic. But this is also stuff that is pre-assumed. Uh, it's assumed that we already know this. Um, and so what happens if I have a positive charge and a negative charge? then what happens is now the force, rather than being repulsive, will be attractive. So if the, they are unlike charges, opposite charges, near each other, they will attract each other. And so this interaction we never discussed any further, at least prior to this level, we shouldn't have. And this is what the crash course is all about, how to define an electric field and how to relate this to charges. So it turns out that if I want to define an electric field, I'm just going to type this out to conserve laziness. So an electric field is a region in space in which a stationary charged particle feels a force. So I'm going to say this again. It's a region in space where a stationary charge, now I'm very specifically using the word stationary electric charge, experiences or feels a force. And the reason why I'm saying specifically stationary and not any charge is because if a charge is moving and it experiences a force, that force may be due to the magnetic field. So we don't have complete certainty. But when charges are stationary, if you already have gone through the topic of magnetic fields, you know that stationary charges do not feel a magnetic force. So if we ensure that the, the charge is stationary, we know that the force it is feeling is an electric field. So the, the electric field is any region in space, just like any field is a region in space. But an electric field is specifically where the charge will feel an electric force. And so this is a recap on charges and a definition of the electric field. So just like gravitational fields, which you have some knowledge of, we can represent this field by imaginary field lines. So things in space that will sort of give us an idea of how the field is acting, even if we can't see them. Now, we have a slight difference to gravitational fields in that we have positive and negative charges, but we never had positive or negative masses. All our masses were positive and gravity was always an attractive force. For electric charges, we have that field lines also exist around electric charges, just like field lines existed around masses. But now we have two types of charge, and so the field lines can vary. And if I take a stationary positive charge, a tiny positive charge, point charge specifically, I have that I still have radial field lines like I do for gravitational fields, but the field lines point outward. And if I have a negative charge, then the field lines for the negative charge point inwards, but they are still radial. Again, this is a point charge. Now, we generally assume point charges in electric fields because things that are charged, at least particles that are charged, like in the electron, for example, are so small that we can assume them, assume them to be point charges, occupying simply a point in space. If I bring these two charges together, their 
electric fields interact and hence they feel an attractive force. And so the field lines nearby these charges will change shape. And you can see the field lines move from positive to negative. They start on positive, end on negative, and they will curve from positive to negative. And so very similar to gravitational field lines, we're also doing an attractive scenario here. So this is a, almost analogous to the gravitational field example. But what do the, let's remind ourselves what the field lines tell us. Well, the, the electric field lines here tells us the line of force and specifically the line of force on a positive charge because now we can have positive and negative. So what does this mean? That means if I take a free positive charge, let's take a positive test charge, and if I throw this positive test charge into the field, it will follow the field lines. It will move along the electric field line depending on where I throw the positive charge into the field. And so it will feel a force being repelled from by the positive charge attracted to the negative charge. So the field line is a line of force that tells us the direction that the positive charge will move. Also, you can see that these field lines, that they, each field line starts on the positive charge perpendicular to the surface and then ends on a negative charge. It's going to use these symbols plus and the letters VE for positive and minus and VE for negative. Again, just to conserve energy, being a physics teacher and all. Next, they are smooth curves. They never meet, they never cross. If they do cross, that means there will be two forces acting on the same positive charge at one point in space, which can never happen. We can never have a particle feeling two forces from a single electric field at the same point. And so they never touch and obviously, since they can't touch, they can't cross. And so the field lines are, like we see, similar to that of gravitational fields. And importantly, the closer the field lines, the stronger the field. The further apart the field lines, the weaker the field. So What this means is, again, if I take my positive test charge here and I bring it into the field, if I bring it to a point where the field lines are close together, it will be repelled with a larger force. And if I take it to a point where the field lines are spread far apart, then the force is weaker. So at the point somewhere in between the two charges, there's a weaker force because the distance between co consecutive field lines is larger. So that's a large distance there and a smaller distance there. And so this is what the field lines tell us, which is nothing that we haven't heard before, but this is for the case specifically for electric fields. So following on naturally from this is the electric field strength. And essentially, what is this? Well, as the name suggests, it's the strength of the electric field. So nothing surprising there. But we have to give it a very physical definition. And we define it with the symbol uppercase E. And we say the electric field strength is the force per unit charge felt by a point charge. So we define it as the force per unit positive charge on a stationary point charge. And so the electric field strength now has a definition and now has an equation. So how do I visualize this? So here, here's a positive test charge. Here's a positive charge, rather. It has an electric field. It's a point charge. The electric field is a radial pointing outward. And so there's an electric field because there's a point charge giving out this electric field. And there happens to be another little test charge with charge Q in this electric field, and obviously we know it will be repelled by this positive charge, and it will feel a force to the right as we've drawn the diagram. So this force from the equation above is Q times E. 
So how do I define this electric field strength? Well, I don't need to go and ask the big charge. I can speak to the small charge, little q, and I can say, okay, little q, can you tell me the force that you're feeling? And little q says, well, the force I'm feeling is F. Then I ask the charge, well, can you tell me the magnitude of your charge? And the charge says, yes, my magnitude of charge is little q. And so from this information, I can then determine what the electric field strength will be. I don't have to make a direct measurement of the electric field strength. I can measure the force that an external particle feels and then hence tell the, the strength of the electric field. And so from here, we can see, I'm going to use square brackets like I always do to denote units of measurement. Units of electric field strength, we can see from here is force over charge is a Newton per Coulomb. There aren't any fancy derived units for electric field strength, so we'll stick with Newton per Coulomb, which is good enough to be fair. So just like gravitational fields, where we said close to the Earth, the fields can be uniform, electric fields can be uniform as well. The thing is, electric fields are more common, we can more commonly find uniform electric fields than we can gra uniform gravitational fields because everything that's gravitationally significant in the universe is generally round or roundish or elliptical. But electric fields can exist for objects that are, are weirdly shaped. They could be flat and long, they could be round, they could be point charges, etc. So what is a uniform field? Well, it is an electric field, specifically electric in this case, where the electric field strength E is the same at all points. So the word uniform means the same throughout, the same at all points. Everywhere you look, everything is the same. Just as if you go to school and you have to wear a uniform in your school, everyone wearing the uniform means everyone looks the same, everyone looks similar. So a uniform electric field is one in which the electric field strength, E, is the same throughout. So an example of this would be, and this is important, if you've already studied capacitors, or capacitance, then you know that this will come up in capacitance. But let's imagine that my charged objects are two parallel metal plates. I apply a potential difference across the two plates, and I make one positively charged and make the other negatively charged. So these could be connected into a circuit. Again, if you've studied capacitance already, this is easier. If you haven't, let's just imagine that I have these two plates, and since they are metal, they are conductors, I can have any charge I like on either of these plates. So one of them is positive, the other is negative. It turns out it's not that difficult to, to set up a situation like this. Now, if I have a charged particle, a positively charged particle with charge plus Q in between the plates, what I find is that an electric field, remember electric fields point from positive to negative. So because the charge is uniformly distributed along each of these plates, there are as many positive as negative as well, I have a field that is uniform, meaning the lines are equally spread apart, the magnitude of the field is the same everywhere, and the field doesn't change in between the plates. So the particle itself will feel a force F, it's a positively charged particle, so it will be repelled from the positive plate and attracted to the negative plate. And we can also say that the separation between the plates we call D. So looking at the setup, if I want to know the work that's done to push this positive particle from positive plate to negative plate, that's force times distance. Both are in the same line, so I can simply say F times D. But also, what I know is that the potential difference between these two points in an electrical circuit is the work done per unit charge in getting the charge from the positive plate to the negative plate, which means that the work done, W, is V times Q. Wait a minute, I have two expressions for the work done. It turns out that the work done electrically is V times Q, and this is equal to force times distance which means what I get is that force per unit charge is V over D. But by definition, force per unit charge from above was electric field strength. So the electric field strength 
is force per unit charge, which is V over D. V being constant between the plates, D also being constant means the electric field strength is constant, hence it is uniform. And so for parallel plates, or for uniform fields, for uniform electric fields specifically, the electric field strength is V over D, the potential difference between the two plates divided by the separation of the plates. But hold on, this gives us another unit of measurement for electric field strength. It's a volt on the numerator and a meter on the denominator. So the unit of measurement for electric field strength is volts per meter. So it turns out that volts per meter and newtons per coulomb are equivalent. We could use either one for electric field strength. Usually for uniform fields between two plates, we say volts per meter. And for any other type of field, we'll say newton per coulomb for a particle in a non-uniform field, etc. So now I've seen that charged particles actually will react to electric fields. So I can manipulate this behavior, which I do for many real-world applications, which you can read up on. But what happens when I place charged particles in an electric field? So we're going to discuss what happens when I place a charged particle stationary in between in, a magnet, in an electric field and then when I have a charged particle moving into the region of an electric field. So now I'm going to take the same scenario, I'm just going to orient it slightly differently. I'm going to take a positive plate and I'm again the charges are uniformly distri distributed in this um, metal or whatever it may be because it's a conductor and then this positive charge will then give rise to a negative charge on a plate that is directly opposite it's the same length it's the same type of material and will induce the same charge but all negative negative. and the potential difference between the two plates is v we can assume that the negative plate may be grounded here. And I have, like I've said before, a uniform field. Again, the separation between the, pl the plates is D, and I generate a uniform field pointing from positive to negative, constant magnitude everywhere. So this is a uniform electric field. Now imagine for a moment I take a particle, I'm going to take a positive particle, again just by convention, just positive particle, place it at the positive plate. What's going to happen is that it's going to move from the positive plate to the negative plate. And what I'm going to assume is that when it hits the negative plate, which it eventually will, it'll have a speed v. So what I'm going to do here is say that initially it has electric potential energy is energy due to it being repelled by the positive plate and attracted to the negative plate, which I know is V times Q. So the total work I'm going to do to push the particle from the positive to the negative plate is VQ. Now by the conservation of energy, so I'm going to call this electrical energy for now, by the conservation of energy, what I know is that when it hits the negative plate, all of this electrical potential energy must be converted to kinetic energy. And this is a half mv squared. So we assume that the mass of this particle is m as well. It could be an electron, well, it's positively charged, maybe a proton, or even a positron. So the speed of this particle v can be determined if I know the energy I give it and I know the mass of the particle. So it turns out little v is the square root of 2 times big V times q divided by the mass of the particle m. So by adjusting the potential difference between the plates, I can actually choose the speed of the particle as it strikes the, the negative plate, which is quite an interesting prospect because I can use this, which I do, for multiple applications. So that's a particle that's initially stationary and then moves, accelerates from the positive to the negative plate and strikes the negative plate with a final velocity v. I could even turn that into a little bit of a kinematics problem if I wanted to give you more nightmares. But it is possible that we make that into a kinematics problem with initial and final velocities and all of those dreadful things.
Now I'm going to change the scenario just very slightly. I'm going to again have my two plates, both of them being parallel, one of these conducting plates positive, the other one negative. But now I'm going to pass a particle, actually I can pass the same particle, mass m charge plus q with a horizontal velocity. So I'm assuming that these two plates are parallel and horizontal and the velocity of the particle before it enters the region between the plates is also horizontal. And so yes, I have uniform electric field. Now the electric field lines are pointing from positive to negative. This is a positively charged particle, so it will move with the field lines when it gets into the field. So what happens is that this charged particle will have its path constantly facing a force in the downward direction. And so the particle curves in the region between the plates. And so what happens is there is straight motion before it enters the region of the plates, there's no force acting on the particle. The motion is curved in the region between the plates as there's a constant force acting downwards. So its horizontal component of velocity will remain the same, but its vertical component of velocity will change as it accelerates down towards the negative plate. If it doesn't strike the negative plate, it will reach, it will leave the region between the plates after it leaves the electric field, it will no longer feel that force and then continue to move in a straight line. So there's an extra application of electric fields. If I pass a particle through an electric field, it will move, aligning itself, a charged particle will move, aligning itself to the field lines, and it will feel a force whilst in that field. If I remove it from the field, the force is removed as well. Now, you can try the same thing, but maybe change the positively charged particle to a negatively charged particle. And what you would see is that the field lines would then change direction. So the, rather not the field lines will change direction, but the motion of the particle will change direction. And a negatively charged particle will, be, will curve upwards rather than downwards. And so that's another application of the electric field. We can use it to curve the path of charged particles. This, the usefulness of this will be more apparent when we study magnetic fields. So what else do we need to do? Well, we need to talk about the electric force between two charged particles and Coulomb's law. So again, we're going to consider point charges because these are the easiest to discuss. Anything else will require a little bit of calculus, which is out of the scope of our syllabus. So we'll deal with point charges to make our life a little easier. So how do we find the electric force between charges? Well, it turns out we don't need to because someone already has. And so we can just copy their intelligent idea. And this person happens to be Charles Coulomb. And Coulomb, with some experimentation, found that the electric force between two charged particles Let's assume I have a charge Q1 and then a charge Q2. and They are separated in vacuum by a distance of R. What he found was that the force between these two particles, if they are like, then they will repel. If they are unlike, they will attract. But yeah, I can draw a better straight line than that. If they are like, they repel. If they are unlike, they attract, but there's a force on them nonetheless. The magnitude of this force, he found, was proportional to the product of charges, Q1 times Q2. He also found that the magnitude of the force was inversely proportional to the square of the separation between these point charges. Ah, sounds very familiar. So mathematically, this is F is some constant K, if I ch change the proportionality into an equation, I need a constant. K times Q1, Q2 over R squared. With more mathematics, which I'm not going to do, and you aren't required to know, this proportionality constant is 1 over 4 pi times Greek letter epsilon with subscript 0, epsilon naught, I'll refer to it. And then this is multiplied by Q1, Q2, over r squared. 
This expression is the mathematical expression of Coulomb's law. So Coulomb's law says the electric force between two point charges is directly proportional to the product of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the separation between them. So this is what is known as Coulomb's law, specifically for two point charges, looks analogous to Newton's law of universal gravitation because both of them are inverse square laws. In fact, all you need to do is replace the constants and replace the charges with masses and hooray, you have Newton's law of universal gravitation, at least the classical form as we know it. So what is this constant epsilon naught? You're probably wondering, epsilon naught is known as the permittivity of free space. In very simple words, it is how well free space allows electric fields to move through it. If I remove the naught, epsilon is the permittivity of any other substance. How well that substance allows electric fields to move through it. So the permittivity of free space and the permittivity of air don't differ by much. So we just always assume that our charged particles are in air or in vacuum, and this makes our life a lot easier. And this value is. 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 coulombs per volt per meter and this is the this is a constant again this will be in your data sheet so what does this force look like well this is the i'm going to plot a, a sketch graph rather of the force against separation f against r if I bring the charged particles very close, if R is very small, the force is very high. That makes sense. If I bring charged particles very close, they will want to attract or repel each other with a great force. But it's an inverse square law, so the force decreases rapidly with distance until a point where you go to infinity and the force drops off to basically zero. And so this inverse square law means that the force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. And we can see that there are asymptotes on either axis. And so this is the Coulomb's law force between point charges. But what if I want to know the electric field of a single point charge? So this is going to require a little bit more of our imagination now. So I know that point charges produce electric fields, but I want to know how to calculate the field of a point charge. In the past, or previously, what I did was I asked the second charge what magnitude of force it was feeling, and I determined the electric field. But if I didn't have a second charge to ask, how would I find this electric field? So let's take a charge uppercase Q. Again, we'll assume it's positive, so it has field lines that are pointing outward. And I'm going to draw some curvy field lines. We'll see why this is so. But let's assume that at a distance r from this charge, I have another charge q. And so the separation distance here between these two charges is r. And what I can tell immediately is that this charge particle R is going to feel a force. We can assume that it's positively charged. So it's going to feel a force pointing to the right. It's going to be repelled by positive charge Q here. And we said the separation between these charges is R. So the force between these two charge particles, if I use Coulomb's law, is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught big Q times little q over R squared. But if I wanted the electric field that is being created by charge big Q, then I ask little q, hey, what force are you feeling? I'm feeling a force F. What's the magnitude of your charge, little q? So what this means is I can write this as 1 over q, multiplied by the expression for the force that I wrote above, which is the Coulomb's law force, 
which is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught big Q little q over r squared. And what do you know? Little q disappears, it's not really significant, if I know big Q, and it turns out that the electric field strength due to the point charge is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times the magnitude of the charge causing the field big Q divided by r squared. So at a distance r from a point charge, that's the magnitude of the field strength of that charge. And one thing I am neglecting to say here is that electric field is a vector. So always remember that this is a vector quantity, but this equation gives us the magnitude of this vector quantity. And so I don't need a second charge because the electric field will exist in space whether or not a second charge is there to feel the strength or not. Electric fields exist because I have charge big Q. I just use charge little q as a reference point to derive the equation. So what does this mean? This means as the distance from the point charge increases, as r increases, e decreases, but just like f, it drops off with 1 over r squared. So the electric field strength is also an inverse square law, inversely proportional to 1 over r, or inversely proportional rather, to r squared. And so as you go further, the strength of the field will drop. And again, you don't need a second q because this is purely down to how strong the or how strong the field is due to charge q. If I have a bigger charge, I have a stronger electric field at the same distance. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is a little bit tricky to wrap our heads around. And I'm going to do a little bit of extra maths, which is not required for you, but which might help you understand the concept better. But it's the topic of electric potential. Now, potential is not something we were used to prior to maybe studying gravitational potential in A-level physics. But what is electric potential? Let's first define it. So electric potential has a very long definition. It's the work done per unit positive charge. I'm just going to say per unit charge. And it's the work done specifically to bring, I'm writing the definition as a sentence broken up into parts, the work done to bring a small, specifically positive test charge, bring it from where to where, Specifically, bring it from infinity, from a very far distance, to that point in question. So the potential is measured at a point in space, and it differs from point to point. So quite a long definition. But this definition is going to help us with the conceptual understanding, hopefully. So what does this mean? This means I have charge big Q, which is positive. I have a random point in space, which I'm going to call P, and then I'm going to have a second charge, which is also positive, little q. The separation between q and point P, I'm going to call R. Well, the point P is just a point in space. It's not a charged particle. It's just a random point in space. And what I'm going to assume is that this charge particle, little q, is at infinity. When I say at infinity, I don't actually mean it's infinitely far away. I just mean it's far enough away that it doesn't really feel the effects of the force, the electrical force, unless it were to move any closer. So what we do is we make a very important definition. We define that the, magnet, that the electric potential and hence the potential energy stored in the system of two charges at infinity is equal to zero. That means go far enough away and there is no electric field, um, which is basically true. If I go far enough away, the effects are so negligible that I can assume that the potential and the potential energy is zero. And again, let me just say that P is some point in space here. So this is a lot of stuff that you probably wouldn't have seen before, but what am I, why am I doing this? 
Okay, so two positive charges. So very importantly, what this means is big Q will repel little Q. Which means, if I want to do work on charge little Q, as the definition of potential says, I must do positive work. I must physically do work to move little q closer to big Q and closer to big Q and at the same time closer to that point in space P. So I have to do positive work because I'm pushing little q against the force that it's going to feel from big Q until I can get it to point P. Once I have that work, if I divide the work that I do by the charge Q, I get the potential at the point P. Okay, that's a lot of things to understand, but calculating this work is not that easy. So I do apologize. Turn away now if you aren't very calculatically inclined, if you don't like calculus. I'm going to use calculus for a very specific reason. We don't need to know this because we don't do calculus in A-level physics, but again, this is to help your conceptual understanding. Why am I using calculus to find the work done? Well, the, the problem is the force that I apply to charge little q must change every time little q moves closer to p because the force that it, it opposes, which is the force of the big charge, is getting bigger as little q gets bigger to closer to big q. And so this is the integral of f dr and I'm integrating from infinity to r. I'm going from infinity to a point r along the x-axis. And this is equal to minus q, big Q times little q over 4 pi epsilon naught times the integral. These are all constants, so they can come out of the integration. Integral from infinity to r of 1 over r squared dr. Now, where did the minus sign come from? Well, the force that big Q applies on little q is positive, and I can use Coulomb's law to find that force. And so, the force that I must apply on little q must be negative. So that force is to the right. My force in turn needs to be to the left. Hence, my force has to be negative. And so there's a minus sign and it must have the same magnitude as big Q is in order for me to overcome it and push it to the left. Slightly larger, but roughly the same magnitude. And so if I were to solve this, I get minus big Q little q over 4 pi epsilon naught Again, if you do mathematics, this wouldn't be too problematic. Multiplied by minus 1 over r, which is the integral of 1 over r squared, evaluated from infinity to r. And as our poor mathematics skills will tell us, 1 over infinity is 0. So this simplifies to the work done being 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught big Q, little q over r, which conforms with what I said earlier. The work I do must be positive since I'm working against the, uh, the electric field. And by definition, I said potential is work done per unit charge. So W divided by the charge that's being pushed, little q. What does this tell us? That at a point in space, P, which is the distance r away from charge big Q, the potential is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. I take the expression above, divided by little q, and I get big Q over r. And so I found an expression for the work done and the work done per unit charge at a distance r from a charge. And the work done per unit charge is the potential, the electric potential at a single point in space. And if you know the term potential, you'll recognize potential difference from electricity. The potential difference between two points in a circuit is basically the potential at one point 
minus the potential at another point. And that tells us the work done to move a, a charge between those two points in a circuit. And so now we see the relevance of me doing the calculus. Unfortunately, I needed the calculus because the force is changing with position. And so it's not a constant force, which I can just use um, macroscopic quantities um, to describe. So what does this potential look like? Well, it looks slightly different than gravitational fields because electric fields can be repulsive or attractive. So the potential against distance, so at a distance r, if I have a charge causing a field that is positive and the potential has this hyperbolic function with distance, it's no longer related to 1 over r squared, but it's proportional rather to 1 over r. But if my charge was negative, meaning the force would be attractive because little q would still be positive, then just like electric fields, or rather just like gravitational fields, I have a negative potential and a negative potential energy. So for attractive forces, as you can see, the rule is that the potential and potential energy is negative. And I will do another video soon to try and explain as best I can why the potential energies are negative for attractive forces. So I was meant to draw a asymptote, uh, or rather a tangent, but that tangent failed. So let's redraw this line. And I'm just going to draw a tangent, which I'll explain the reason for later on. But this is if I have a negative charge Q causing the electric field, a distance R from the field, the potential actually increases, increases to zero. And for a positive charge, the potential decreases to zero. But we must remember that potential flips about the horizontal X axis depending on whether the charge is positive or negative. Another thing we can define from this graph is that the electric field strength and this is the reason I drew the tangent. Um, the electric field strength, I'm not going to prove this, but the electric field strength is minus the potential gradient. What does that mean? It means minus the gradient of the potential versus dis distance graph, which is what I have above. And so mathematically, we say that if I wanted the electric field strength, but I only have the graph of potential against distance, I can take a minus sign, find the gradient, pop the minus sign in front of the gradient, and I have the electric field strength. So what does that mean? That means here I've taken a point, if I wanted the electric field strength at this point specifically in space, I can say E is equal to minus the gradient of the line at that point. So I draw a tangent, and I find the gradient of the tangent. It's possible that you would be asked to do this. Given a graph, draw a tangent at a specific point, find the gradient of the tangent, hence you have the electric field strength at that point. And so we can use a graph of electric fields of rather potential versus distance to get the electric field strength. And the last thing, which we've kind of already derived, is the electric potential energy. So you've heard of potential energy before, but now it gives this a whole new meet meaning. And just like potential, electric potential energy can be positive or can be negative. It depends on the charge that is causing the field. But what we know is that electric potential energy must equal the work done moving the charge in the field. So what this means is that EP, the potential energy, is equal to the work done, which we've already defined or derived above as 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught big Q times little q over r squared. And this is the same as saying the charge times the potential, which is an equation we already knew. And so this is the equation for electric potential energy, that is the energy that is stored in a system of two charges, big Q and little q, 
separated by a distance r. So again, I'll just draw a rough diagram, big Q and little q, separated by a distance r, that's the electric potential energy stored between them. But you have to be very careful as well whether the potential energy will be negative or positive, depending on whether the charges are attracting or repelling. Again, you can do the same things that you did for gravitational fields to show how a negative potential energy would look. So this was a crash course in electric, electric fields, and I hope it has uncovered some of the secrets. And I also hope that you can see the similarities and the analogies with gravitational fields. And those inverse square laws and potentials and so on look very similar to this. And with little changes, you can see that the similarities will help you understand this topic better. So until next time, I'm Mr. K. Please leave a like, please subscribe, leave a comment in the comment section below. I hope to see you next time on Everything is Relative.